My name is uh, James Thule. I'm the Trout and Salmonid Librarian here at MSU. Uh, the MSU Library has created the world's most comprehensive collection of materials on trout and salmonids. The collection allows organizations, scientists, researchers, legislatures, students, teachers, and conservationists from around the world to access rich information on these beautiful species. The information is used to make cases to support and protect these species, their natural habitats, against those who prefer payment to fields, to unrestricted development over undisturbed natural areas, who prefer short-term profit over long-term economic impact. The collection of over 20,000 volumes features new and historical materials from around the world. We're not limited by language, geography, anything. We collect anything that relates to trout and salmonid species, including we have a book signed by Isaac Walton. We also have the book, oldest book held by any library in the state of Montana. And if you come in for a tour of the collection, I will let you hold those items in your hands. So <laughs> you can actually hold something in your hands that Isaac Walton held in his. So how cool is that? Uh, one of our projects in this area is uh, preserves not only the science, but really the culture and history of fishing is our all our history project. Several people who have participated are here in the audience tonight. Jim Getz, who is here and is also a former lecturer, told me, as did Nat Reed and Dick Vincent, that uh, to win an argument, you start with good science. We preserve that science and freely disseminate it. The Oral History Project has interviewed nearly 400 individuals from over 70 nations around the world and provides a primary, unfiltered resource for the researchers of today and tomorrow. Not only does it preserve a global picture of angling culture, what it means and why it is so important to us, uh, but also a global picture of the effects of climate change and pollution on habitats and fish species. It also captures the efforts of anglers who care about preserving fish in the beautiful places they live. In addition to oral histories, we are honored to be entrusted with preserving the legacy of several angler, anglers through their, and writers through their personal papers. People like Bud Lilly, Tom McGuane, Jim Getz, Nick Lyons, John Garrick, and A.K. Best. Students and researchers can come hold in their hands that draft of the longest silence or the letters Bud sent home when he served in the Navy during World War II. These are original, one-of-a-kind documents, and they live in your MSU library and they're available today and as long as there is an MSU. As I said, ultimately our goal is to help preserve the areas where trout and salmonids live through providing researchers with the tools they need. Another way we do that is to provide by providing transformative learning experiences for our students. One example is that, uh, of that is a class I teach, International Angling and Fishery. Several of my students are here tonight. Several of my former students are here tonight that gives students a hands-on experience working in our archives and special collections, doing research around angling and fisheries, and exposes them to the global culture and history of angling. The class is a study abroad class, and so in January, they will travel to Belize, where they'll see Mayan temples, experience local wildlife habitats, get a chance to eat some amazing foods like conch ceviche and roasted royal rat. Don't knock it till you try it. It's, it's actually pretty delicious and do a bit of fishing, of course. Last year, our class cleaned up 1,548 pounds of plastic off the beach as a part of their conservation work on the trip. For me, the class is really where the rubber meets the road. We are putting our collections to real world use and exposing our students, many of whom will be the next generation of voters, public servants, and wildlife managers to the real world problems facing that future, as well as the real world possibilities of preserving these natural areas. Now I would like to introduce Tom, introduce Tom McGuane, a generous supporter of our library, a former Trout and Salmon lecturer, and an oral history participant, and a recent recipient of the MSU Library Award of Excellence, as well as one of the most eloquent speakers and writers that I have had, ever had the pleasure of meeting. Tom, thank you for being here, for all the support you've given us over the years, and uh, thank you for being willing to introduce Carl. <laughs> yes. That is, a, that is a big ass. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah. So cool. Yeah, he's a great guy, man. What a nice group of people. 
I told Carl, I said, this is a pretty friendly group. Don't be nervous. Um, it's not easy introducing Carl Hyacin because he's an absolute avalanche of productivity. I, I first uh, knew his work when he was a, a columnist for the Miami Herald. And um, he, his columns are now available in three volumes. And if I were introducing him tonight, <clears throat> strictly on the basis of what he achieved as a journalist, on what is can be contained in those volumes, that would be an absolute adequate example of a fully lived life. But that all happened before, uh, before he started writing these celebrated novels, celebrated children's books, celebrated movies. And of all the things that I find annoying besides his enormous sales, <laughs> um, the fact that he won the Isla Morata Bonefish Tournament six times, brought me to my knees. Um, he's had so many accolades uh, that uh, there's little I can add to it except to say that uh, his comic novels are not merely satires of life in South Florida. They're really commentary on uh, the perilous lay way we live today and the perilous relationship we have to the natural world. Most of his early journalism w attacked so many uh, bad guys in South Florida, which is full of them, uh, that I used to fear for his life. <laughs> and I don't think that was unreasonable. Um, he's been a courageous writer, a hilarious writer. He's been a very successful writer. He's still rolling. He's got an enormous horizon of work that he still hasn't done. Uh, it's going to be terrifying for a fellow angler writer to see how much more he will still do. <laughs> um, but uh, I hope you'll uh, welcome him tonight. He's, you'll never see anybody like him again. Um, and neither will I. I want to add to all these accolades that he's received with something that I think will mean a lot to Carl. This is my accolade to Carl. He casts bullets, and he can see, on a cloudy day, he can see bonefish in three feet of water. There was a day when that was true. Uh, it may, may have passed. Thanks so much, Tom. There's so many people here that, uh, 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 heroes and uh, icons, and uh, my dear friend Doug Peacock, been saving the Grizzlies long before it was a thing. Yvonne Chouinard, he hasn't done too much. Um, <laughs> half of you are wearing his gear. Um, uh, it's just, and Tom, of course, who was, is one of the reasons I first came to Montana, so you can blame him and Jim Harrison and their writing, and, uh, and, and in Tom's case, uh, it, uh, they were two writers who were nice enough to write me back when I was writing, just, can I meet you, how do you, what do you do, and they were nice enough to write me back, and to hell with the rest of them, it didn't. <laughs> They're, um, and they're, they're all gone now anyway, so <laughs> screw them. Uh, anyway, I, today, and th Jim, thanks for having me here. Uh, I have to say the title of this uh, lecture was so lofty, and I felt uh, unqualified because I, I have fished for trout many, many years, but I've never, gone, I've never fished for steelhead or any kind of salmon. Uh, I, I can only speak to trout. And, and, and I'll tell some other stories as well. And I'll start with the first time I came to Montana. I was trying to think it was in 19... I knew I'd been in love with bone fishing, saltwater fly fishing since I was a kid. I started out in, growing up in West Broward County in the Everglades, flat as it could be, fishing for bass and brim. And one, one year my friend and I started... I think we saw something at Lefty Cray or someone had done in this thing called fly rod, and we thought that would be fun. And so I remember I asked my dad for a fly rod because we'd go bass fishing in the canals. And, and uh, 
he didn't, he, could, he was an offshore guy, fish from, you know, marlin and sailfish. He couldn't give a rat's ass. He didn't even understand what fly fishing was, so I'm sure he had somebody go to the Sears or whatever and get me, and it was fine. It get me a fly rod and, and the reel. All I needed was a little Fluger medalist, and I would have been happy, but my dad didn't know, and he got me this reel that had a, had a trigger on it so that you could, you could hit the trigger and it'd pull up all the slack, you know, when you're fly fishing. And, but that's not how it's supposed to be. And, and it, it drove me crazy because my friend, my good friend Bob, who later became a great guide, had gotten a little Fluger medalist. He was out there and he had no trouble getting up. And I'm out there dicking around with this little trigger. And so I thought, Dad, I, did, I took the reel in my room one day and it, I didn't realize it was a whole spring contraption. I was messing around with the guy and the whole reel exploded in my hand. And it was like a wire spool shot <laughs> and it was, I had destroyed the Christmas present within a week. So my, made my mom, my mom promised not to tell dad and I ended up getting a little, you know, basic fly reel and that's where I started fly fishing. But I had always read um, about Montana and how beautiful it was. And I, my grandfather for Christmas would always get me three magazines. And I, if I can't remember, Sports of Field, Field of Stream, and there was one other that they all published. You, outdoor Life, yeah, something. And they all came the same, and they all pretty much, I think, had the same writer. Most of the stores, most of the magazines were devoted to uh, grizzly bear attacks. <laughs> Second was um, a b big, buck deer that they'd shot, and then there would be some fishing stories in there. But I remember reading about trout fishing in Montana, so one day, and this was like, I, I want to say 81 or 82, I got on a plane, pl couple of planes, and I ended up in Great Falls, Montana. I had booked to go, to go something I'd never done before, and I bought some waders. You can imagine how good they were in Florida, the waders that you would buy. There was no Amazon then. I don't know where I got them. They, were, they weighed more than I did, I swear to God, at the time, and we went up to and I went, there was a, there was a dude ranch, and, and I don't know if any of the family is here, but it was a, it was the Click family dude ranch, and it was outside of Great Falls, and I remember, wow, this is beautiful country, and of course, this shocking uh, United Airlines broke my fly rods, um, but I brought a couple, and so I got, and, and we we're supposed to take this jet boat and go up to this dude ranch in grizzly country, and the water was too low, and so they put me, on, on horse, a horseback to go up this trail. All I had was sneakers on. And you're trying to, and a horse has no respect for a person who's wearing sneakers, first of all. <laughs> Second of all, I, I don't think I'd ever been on a horse, I swear to God, until then. And I didn't realize that, that especially these, kind of, these trail horses, they're, the fun thing is trying to go as close as they can to a big tree and knock you off. And it was a straight down drop. I mean, it was down, and I thought, what in the hell am I doing? So I get up there. And there's literally, they're not really cut out for fishing. That's not their thing. It's a hunting camp. Grizzly had been in there the, the season before and destroyed. Uh, they had a walk-in freezer. The grizzly had taken the door off. And I'm in awe of and, they, and they're showing me grizzly tracks. And I said, so what do I want to do the next day? I said, I'll just go, I'll go off on my own. I'll be fine. I'll be just fine. <laughs> so I got in the Sun River where I was fishing. It was very narrow. And I... I didn't really understand how rivers work very well because where I lived, it was just swamp. And I remember it was, I thought, well, this isn't a very, and I was casting. I mean, I had a little assortment of flies and I think I caught a couple little fish here and there. They might've been cutthroat, I don't remember. But at one point in the day, it, it got hot and you're in the, I'm hot anyway, but I thought, well, this would be nice. I'll cross this little river right here. I'll feel, it'll feel cool on my waders and I'll just get to the other side. I'll have a better cast. Nothing, what could happen? I was all by myself. It was like canyons and all kinds of stuff. And I remember st taking one step in, taking two, and then I don't remember anything except that I'm going down river and, and I'm thought, and I was too stupid to be scared because it didn't look very deep. I was really, I thought, well, this is just a little creek. Something is poking me in the back of the head as I'm floating along and it's the tip of my fly rod. And I'm thinking, oh shit. So I grab that and I, I throw that up on a bank. And the next thing I know there's a big boulder and I'm plastered against the boulder like a gecko, you know, on a window pane. Uh, there I am. There's nobody's going to hear me. Nobody. And I'm thinking, well, this, and I realize the waders are full of very cold, coldest water that I'd ever been in as a Floridian. 
And I think I've got to get out of this place and maybe the thing to do is get out of the waiters, which is, these, it was easier said than done. So I get out of the waiters and I empty them and I just, and I have to go up this hill with my fly rod and I'm forlorn. I didn't really have, I had one fish that I caught that I, had, that I caught and I was going to take it back to camp and have it for, for dinner. And I, I thought I had lost the fish too because it was in a little, Creel, one of the things you, they tell you to buy when you don't know anything. And I, and I think the fish is lost. I get my waders off, and, um, and there's something not right. And I look in there, and it's full of water. The, the, the freaking trout is still kind of swimming around in the, in the wader thing. You know, it was a lie. But so I said, by God, I'm going to eat that son of a bitch. And I, I, so I walk up. This is a true story. I walk, I get up the hill. I'm in not in great shape anyway. I mean, I'm just not used to mountain. I'm not used to elevation. I get up to the hill and I find my way back to the click lodge or the click dude, whatever it was. And they were very nice people, but I didn't realize they had a strict rule that if you weren't in camp by six o'clock, you didn't eat. Everybody ate at six and they rang this giant bell, which you can't hear at the bottom of a canyon, I promise you. And I walk in with my trout, and the, the whole lodge area is dark, dark. They're going to bed. And it's only like 6.30. Everybody's in bed. There's no food. And I have a dead, stinking trout. And I thought to myself, I've got to do more of this kind of fishing. And, <laughs> um, and so my, my own background after learning to you know, catch bass and brim was I, I had gotten really addicted to saltwater fly fishing, like Tom mentioned, for bonefish, tarpon, and permit. Living in South Florida, it's hard not to. And, and uh, one thing you learn pretty quickly is that it, uh, it, when you're fishing for trout, it's a whole different thing. You know, the strike is complete. You, it's a, you're, I got a 100-pound tarpon, it's a strip strike. Uh, and if you try that, it doesn't work that well in the river. You know, you got to retrain your brain to think, no, this is... So you, I, I remember uh, that I was dedicated to um, uh, self, you know, just abusing myself and humiliating myself in every possible way, which is possible with the fly rod. There's nothing, there's nothing elegant about the bad things that happen to you. I mean, the cast is great on a distance in a documentary and the Brad Pitt thing, that looks great on screen. It doesn't generally play out well. Casting, trying to cast 100 feet of line, but I remember being so uh, fixated with fishing, and I remember fishing with my friend Bob one down in Isla Mirada during tarpon season, and we were up, the boat staked out on a point, and it's windy as hell, and Bob says to me, you know, there's, we, we, the tarpon are coming this way, we're all set up, and we're cast, I haven't had anything to eat yet, we're casting the streamers. And I remember I, there was some tarpon coming, and I, so I start my back cast like this, and Bob says, hey, there's a permit coming, look to your left. And the permit, big permit, which is, you know, a rare and, and, and completely contrary creature is coming like I had any chance at all of catching. So I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll, in midair, I'm gonna switch directions, casting a 2-0 stream about this long. It'll work just fine in this 20-knot wind. And so I turn, and I cast, and I don't see a fly, but I feel something, you know, and you're thinking, well, okay. And Bob says, um, look down. And I look down and in my thigh, I, had, I was wearing shorts, you know, we never wore sunblock, we just t-shirt shorts out there. In my thigh, the streamer is buried all the way up to where the feather comes out. There's no sign of the hook, it's buried. And I said, and this has another true story, and I said, and Bob said, well, what should, I'm bleeding all over. He goes, what should we do? And I said, I don't know. What, what can we do? Because we got our spot in line for the tarpon. We don't want to give up this spot. He goes, hell no. And I said, well, can, and there, there's a trick that all anglers here know where you, if you hook yourself and the barbs out, you tie a loop or something. Well, Bob, my friend, didn't have a clue how to do that. I didn't know how to do it. He said, I can try it but I'm not sure it's gonna work because I can't see the rest of the flock. He tries, it doesn't work, I'm in pain. So he said, okay, lie down, I'll just cut, the, I'll cut it out. He had, a, he had a Rapala filet knife <laughs> that I'm guessing hadn't been cleaned since we were in about ninth grade. He said, I'll go, I'll wash it off and we'll cut it out. And so I, at this point, I, I was getting a little dizzy. There was some blood issues, you know. And he p puts me down in the bow of the boat on my back and I said, and he starts, and I said, whoa, whoa, I said, what, might it not help to put some ice and at least numb this area? He goes, hey, good idea. So he gets some ice, puts it on there, numbs it. 
and he cuts the fly, he just cuts the fly out and yanks it out. And now there's a mess, and I said, so I take off, or rip off something, part of my shirt, and I make a tourniquet around this thing, because I'm a medical guy, you know, I know exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> and I tie this thing off, I tie this stupid thing off, and I said, I think we're good to go. And he goes, how do you feel? Do you still feel dizzy? I don't feel dizzy anymore. Tarpon pouring down this bank. You know, I said, I feel good. So there, he's got a picture of me. This is about five hours later, right? There's a picture of me, and I, I hooked a big fish right around, you know, before sunset. There's something, it's almost dark. We're out there like idiots. Now I've got a big tarpon on. He's got a picture of me fighting it. And the, this turn, this blood red tourniquet on my bare leg, and I'm, you know, I think I'm a macho guy, and and of course afterwards we, you know, we go in that night. He says, what, you know, I said, then what do you know about tetanus? Does I mean, is there should we probably? And he said, I think we might go to the emergency. Well, maybe we. So I remember we had to go to the Mariners Hospital emergency room on Plantation Key. Their, their specialty is hook. All they do is remove fish hooks, basically. <laughs> Come right in. Good, you're good to go. That's the kind of stupid thing. And I thought this was just, I thought only saltwater fly fishermen were that, you know, deranged. But um, that's not true. I found out with trout, it's the same thing. Um, another time, I, 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 we lived in Isla Mirada for uh, quite a few years. And I would go out at night. I'd work during the day, I would write. And then I would go out, and I had a skiff. And I could go out. There were some great uh, bonefish flats behind the house back in the day when they had really big bonefish. And I would go out by myself, again, really smart, by yourself in, at dusk. And, um, and I would, and so one, one day I was out there and I, I uh, pulling myself around. I had the fly rod in the front of the boat and I was barefoot. So I, the idea was you stake, if you see a fish, you stake out, you jump off the platform, you make a perfect cast and you catch a, a big, that was the idea. So there's a big bonefish tailing, really big one. I stake out, tie it off, hop off the platform as quietly as I can, go to the front of the boat. Now here's the, th and I never took my eyes off the, this tail, it's waggy. And, and there's my rod, and there's the fly. And ideally, you should probably look at your equipment before you pick it up. I think that would have been a better move. But I was just kind of blindly, I picked up my fly rod, and I reached around, and, and I dropped, uh, I dropped the, the rod, and it, the hook, I was holding just the line, and the hook came up, and it went into this hand and that vein right there. And I can't, ca and I can't, <laughs> And I, and I look, and now there's a little fountain. It's just spurting at me. I'm all by myself. And of course, I make enough noise. The bonefish is gone. I'm all pissed off. But I realize that the, the boat, it, there's a lot of blood. I should do something about this. So I pulled the stake out, and I had shoes. I had a bunch of stuff on the boat. And I just drifted into deep water, and I turned it on, put it in gear, and all this flying off the back of my boat, because I was worried. I, I, again, I'm getting a little dizzy, I don't like blood. I thought, I gotta get back to a dock uh, somewhere. So, I, and so I, got, I got home, and again, tied it off, but I had this, this bone crab fly in my wrist. Uh, so I tied it off with the crab fly, my wrist, straight to Mariner's Hospital. Hey, Mr. Hyacin, come on in. <laughs> same, same stuff. <laughs> but that's, I mean, that's, just the, the, the level of what you do if you love something, I guess. Um, so I started fishing in, in Montana, and then I started coming back almost every year if I could. And eventually we got a place near Livingston, so in the summer we, we, we come. And both my, my boys uh, can, can outfish me, and that's one thing I'm very proud of. But I think what they fell in love with, both in Florida and here in Montana, was just an incredible connection with nature. It was, you were just in such a place, and, and on the right day, it, 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 even if you get skunked, whatever it is, you're in a special place surrounded by just breathtaking beauty. And, and I wanna say, the fish, for a normal person, you would say, well, the fishing becomes secondary then, doesn't it? And that's, your answer should be yes, but in my case, I just, no, damn, I wanna catch a fish. <laughs> And I'm afraid I, spoil, I might have spoiled it for my kids a little bit, a little bit intense, a little bit intense. Um, my, I remember uh, uh, my oldest son, who's, who's not here tonight, my youngest son is, but he, uh, I remember taking him, uh, he, I, had a, I had a small skiff and I had a platform for myself. I remember at six years old taking him bone fishing. And you know, if, if there's nothing else you can say about a six year old, they're incredibly quiet and patient. They'll sit there. <laughs> for at least two or three minutes before they start. But 
Scotty was very into fishing and, and I had him rigged up with a spinning rod and I was pulling him along. Uh, we were down in Marathon near Vaca Key. Tom, Tom knows where that is. And I'm, I'm pulling around down there and Scotty said, um, and I'm looking, I said, keep your eyes out there for a moment. We're only gonna get a couple shots. I had a shrimp on his line. And he said, Dad, there's a, there's a permit just popped up behind you. I said, yeah, right. You, you, how do you even know what a permit? Just we'll keep, watch ahead of it. So I keep pulling like a, the macho asshole that I am. Yeah, no, forget about it. I look out the corner of my eye, and there's a big permit tail wagging like this. And he goes, I, you know, and I spun the boat, of course, scaring. This minute you spin the boat, they're gone, and it was gone. And he's never let me forget that. You remember that first permit you told me wasn't there? Well, it was there. So I feel like I've kind of inf in, infected them a little bit. Um, now, I've done, I don't know that I've done anything on a Montana River as dang, well, maybe yes, but as dangerous as, or as, or as inexplicable as some of the things I, I did is saltwater fly fishing. Um, and you hear these stories about big tarpon, and it does get in your blood. And I remember one time we were off, the, off a long key, and I hooked one. And it was, I mean, by tarpon standards, it wasn't, I would say, a huge, it was big. It was plenty big. It was probably 110, 110 pounds or so. And, uh, you know, uh, it, everything was normal. I had the fish by, you know, I got the fish eventually up to the, almost to the side of the boat where you could get the fly out. And then it, it all of a sudden gets the second wind, and it zooms off. Instead of like zooming off on the flats or towards one of the bridges, it starts just heading out to, out to Andros Island. And, and I've got a drag pretty tight on it. I said, Bob, what's going on? He goes, what are you, what are you, where's your drag? He checks the drag and it was right. And he, he goes, okay, so we'll follow it. He puts the engine down, off we go. And we're out in the Hawk Channel in a little skiff. It's wind, you know, it's like this. And f four and a half hours later, I said to him, sun's going down. And I said, you know, when this son of a bitch rolls again, two things are gonna happen. I'm either gonna stop him and back him up, or I'm gonna break him off, but we're gonna go eat dinner. And he said, you're absolutely right, I'm sick of this too. Because at that point, the fit, it's like being hooked to a, a Greyhound bus. It, there's, there's no, there's not jumping anymore. The thing is just trying to kill you, kill your spirit, kill your soul, and it, and it worked. So sure enough, and the tarpon rolls and I just, held all the line and, and actually the, fl the, um, the actual fly line, bam, broke. And I said, well, we got a story, don't we? And uh, Bob said, yeah, let's go get something to eat. And that was the last time I ever fought a fish that long. And I don't regret doing it, but I, I think of the, the manic state of mind that you have to be in. And there are people that have fought these fish for 10, 12 hours that are world record hunters and followed them around all night with GPS uh, in the middle of Florida Bay tracking a tarp and they're trying to get on a very light leader, eight pound test, just a six pound, whatever it is. Insanity. Curious. I, I, one friend of mine was trying to get a world record and he hooked one somewhere uh, in Florida Bay and fought it for almost 14 hours and he actually fell asleep while he was fighting the fish. He sat down on the console and he fell asleep. And the guide at that point is just motoring, the fish is motoring, uh, you know, you're motoring along. Fish is not, you can't pick up uh, or move or do anything decisive. You're just waiting for him to get tired. Um, and, and, and he fell asleep and the, the guide would wake him up every now and then, saying crank down, crank, oh, okay. And, and, uh, and after all that, they got the tarp into the boat. Uh, because it's a, it was going to be a world record in that line class, the guy you know, had a big gaff, kill gaff, and um, stuck the gaff in the fish after all this time. And the, the guy who, the guide who I know, Dustin Huff, who is Steve Huff's son, stuck him and he went, the fish took off, dragged him underwater for a great deal of time, uh, uh, straightened the gaff, and swam away. And alive, and that was the, it was like a giant middle finger back at the boat, and the and the guide, and it was gone. So you're after these are incredible creatures. Now, I will tell you that the, I'll tell you also a story about uh, fly fishermen. As you know, we'll do anything if someone offers us a free trip somewhere to do anything. It doesn't matter how f famous, semi-famous. It doesn't matter if somebody says. Uh, hey, you want to come along and go fly fishing? Even if you can't stand anybody else 
on the boat. You'll go because that's how sick you are. Even if the, <laughs> even if the company is going to be terrible. Um, now, in this case, the company wasn't terrible. This was, I, had, I, I wrote a book, I don't know why I want to say 86 or 87. Anyway, it was a book about, called Double Whammy, and it was about sex, murder, and corruption on the professional bass fishing circuit. <laughs> and I had rushed to get this book out because I was afraid that uh, Cheever was working on that book. Um, <laughs> Updike, I was sure, had one in the pipeline on bass fishing, so I was going to stake out this literary territory before, before Tom got to it, too. So anyway, I had written this book, and it was the most messed up book. I mean, it was really a twisted book in a lot of ways. There was a pit bulldog that attacks a guy and a burglar, and the burglar kills the dog, and the dog doesn't let go. The dog's dead. It's on his arm. For a long time, he names the dog, he goes delirious, the dog's got a name and everything. So it's about a 100-page relationship between a guy and a dead dog, if that gives you any... But anyway, so I get a, I get a call. I get a call from... I, I don't know if any of you are golfers. The golfer's name is Fuzzy Zeller. He won the Masters a couple of times. He's a character, and he loved to fish, apparently. He said, well, he, said he loved to fish. Anyway, he, was, he had a show at this time. He fell out of favor for, for certain things that he said eventually. But at that time, he, he had a very popular outdoor show, F Fuzzy's, Kmart, Kmart's Fuzzy Zeller's Outdoor. Kmart was the sponsor. You get, you get the picture, right? Kmart has sponsoring an outdoor show, and Fuzzy said, I'm going, he calls me, he said, I love that book, I'm going to the Bahamas, I'm shooting a show in the Bahamas for bonefish, and I know that you're a bonefisher and you want to go along. I didn't know anybody else, I really didn't know Fuzzy, and I hadn't golfed in years and years, and, and, but I, it was a free trip, and I said, hell yes, I'm there, Fuzzy, uh, buddy, uh, let's go, bro, and uh, so we fly over to the, this uh, Great Harbor Key in the Bahamas, and we land. And, uh, and somebody, Fuzzy was a, let me say that the weight on the plane, about half of it was fly tackle and human weight, and about half of it was vodka in bottles. As, as near as I could tell, that was kind of the weight ratio on the plane. Fuzzy was in a good mood all the time. And so we get off on this little runway in the Bahamas, and, and we look around, and, and the pilot, somebody thought it would be funny to say, hey, Fuzzy, how far do you think you could hit a golf ball on this runway? Fuzzy digs around the plane, he comes out with a driver and a golf tee, a golf tee. And, this, and I said, where are you gonna tee up the ball? He goes, right in the runway. And it's hot asphalt. And he puts a tee in, puts the ball down. It's like a 5,000 foot runway. And he couldn't be happier. And he knocks a drive down the middle. And we're like idiots, we're, standing, we're just watching it bounce, bounce. So we can't see the ball anymore. Of course, anybody, anybody's gonna, throw a golf ball out, so he hits it out, he's happy, he gives, everyone's happy, he says, Fuzzy, that's so great, he puts the tea in his pocket. And so then we commence, there's a camera crew, we go out, and uh, the whole trick, if you're the star of a TV show, apparently, is you have to be in some of the TV show, and if it's a fishing show, you have to catch some fish. So we had a first couple of slow days. I was having a great time. I mean, I was, I laid back behind the camera crew and there was a lot of tailing bonefish and I, I think I had a five weight even and I was catching a lot of great, you know, I mean, every fish is great. So catching them and Fuzzy's getting a little more, you know. And so like the second or third day, it's starting to blow and, and Fuzzy hooks when I hear the camera crew called me, Carl, come up. We want to get a picture of your face while you're watching Fuzzy fight the fish. I'm all for Hollywood. I'm, go, I'm in. I'm game. I go stretching. I got my rod. I'm, I'm standing there. I got a little khaki shirt on. It was pretty, you know, like I, I did kind of care, but I was just standing there. The camera's on me, you know. And oh, good, good fuzzy. And he's, fight, he's fighting the thing. He's fighting the fish in. You know, it's run out, you know, 100 yards. And he's fighting the fish in. And the handle of his reel, you know, the, the handle part falls off into the water. Now, it's very hard, even if you're not anglers, I'll just take my word, it's really hard to reel in a fly reel with no handle on. <laughs> Fuzzy, and the camera's are rolling. And of course, being a smart ass, I put my hand on Fuzzy's shoulder and he's go out there. And I said, did you get that reel at Kmart, Fuzzy? <laughs> so, here's, here's, what that, here's what that crafty bastard did. He reaches into his pocket finds a golf tee, a golf tee, and, and the holes in the, in, the, in the fly reel, he puts it into the hole, one of the holes of the fly wheel, 
and he reels in the fish with the golf tee, which made, which made for much better TV than if you're just catching it like a normal human would catch it. And we got the fish. And here's the thing. I, they cut out my line about Kmart. <laughs> Those, those cowardly, cowardly bastards. So, but anyway, that's the kind of thing you would do if you're a fly fisherman. Go, yeah, I'll go. I'll go wherever you want. I'll do whatever you want. So I, I, was, I began coming to Montana a lot and, and, and fishing with guides or, or fishing, wading when I could and trying to learn about trout, which is it's a whole different creature, obviously, but the beauty and the precision that you need of fly casting is the same. And, and um, I, I met some, so many wonderful people fishing. And, and uh, one of our good friends is a fishing guide up near Craig on the Missouri River. And, and, um, and I, you, I think he would say, well, you can take the, the, the boy out of Florida, but you can't take Florida out of the boy. Because he had mentioned on one of our trips that he, um, that he had a, a rat problem, a, a field mice and rat problem. It was a hot summer. And in his place, he had all these problems. And I had said to him early in the trip, uh, well, if we, if we see a bull snake, I'll catch it. And we can bring it up to your place and let it go. And he says, what are you talking about? And I said, well, you know, I grew up in, you know, on the edge, all we did when we weren't fishing was catching snakes. It was just, there was nothing else, you know, and I bring, we had uh, pillowcases that we would take with us, and we'd go out for snake catching, we'd bring them back, and we'd sort the snakes at the house. We'd let the ones go that we didn't want to keep as pets. It seemed like a normal thing to do when you were a kid. <laughs> my, mo my mother was terrified of snakes, and um, we had a garage, you know, we'd moved into this house, and there was an open garage, but if you put the garage door down, it was just a concrete surface, it was a great place to snake. The, if you dump the snakes, they were, they, you could sort them pretty easily, they'd all go in, but you could see them, you could get them. So I remember I got in trouble, because my mom, we finally, we, 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 she finally got a, someone to help her with the, we had a bunch of kids, so she had finally got someone to help her with the laundry, it would come once a week and stuff. And I didn't know she was, Louise was even more terrified than my mom of snakes. And so one day, Bob and I, we'd had a great day. We had some black racers, king snakes. They're all going on. We're just sort of, you know, normal kids. I remember Louise came out of the house to go, the, the, the washer dryer was in the garage, and she came out holding a bunch of family laundry. And she took one look, screamed, dropped the laundry, and went home. It was weeks before my parents were able to track her down again. And I got in such, such trouble for that. But anyway, the snake thing, you know, the kids all had snakes when they were kids. Quinn, <laughs> Quinn had his pipe. We all, it was just a thing. So anyway, we're on the Missouri, and I just made a comment to Bo because I, I, I thought I could help him out with the rat issue. If you get a, a you know, they'll, they'll take care of the rodent thing. Sure enough, we round the bend somewhere up there, and, and, there's a, and he goes, how do you know it's not a rattler? I said, it's not a rattler. He said, it looks just like a rattler. I said, row me up to the thing. Row me up to the snake. So Katie was on the boat. And we were... We row up, it's not a rattler. So I scoop the thing up, I'm holding, and Bo's going, oh, geez, what? I said, do you want to get rid of the field mice or not? He goes, okay. And, I, and he said, well, he said we, got a, we got a bunch of good spots coming up. What are you going to do with the snake? I said, do you have anything I can put a snake in? You don't have a, you don't have a pillowcase on the boat? No, he had no pillowcase. <laughs> so here's what he did, and this is the truth, and Katie will tell you. This is a guide and a friend. He took off his pants. <laughs> he tied off the legs on his pants. We put the snake in his pants and we cinched off the waist with the waistband of the pants. And hence, you have a snake bag. It was a pretty big bull snake. And so we still have fishing to do, keep in mind. So then, here's what I did, because this kind of guy I am. I gave the bag to Katie. I said, would you hold this for the rest? And the thing, I'm telling you, the pants were alive. You mean the, the snake was not going quietly. He was all over it, so you got the pants. Katie's holding the things, and then, we, but we took, we did take turns, and then when my turn, it was her turn in the bow, I held the snake. Bo, Bo had no interest in holding the snake. We got it to his house, he had a big wood, wood pile where some of the, and, and he took a video of me, saying, and we released the, the bull snake. It was, a, it was a Disney moment, the whole thing was like. <laughs> a couple years later, same thing happens. I said, is this the spot? where we caught the last bull snake. He goes, yeah, but you know, I haven't seen that snake since you let it go. 
And I, and I said, do you need another snake? He goes, well, I guess I could use another snake, but we're not gonna see another snake. And he said, it was a nice trout fishing. We were catching fish that day, and, but you, then a, a, even bigger ones crossing, same thing. This, I don't know how we contain that one. But anyway, we released that one. Go, it's become a ritual, except this week we didn't see any bull snakes up there. I think it's a little too cool. But anyway, I, to me, that's a, just a normal day on the water. Is a, you know, we, we have pythons in Florida, uh, bull snakes on the Missouri, the connection should be obvious. Uh, it's so, you know, I, it's so disturbing. I wanna tell, I wanna tell the story because uh, uh, Tom and Lori McGuane are here and um, uh, 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 Jimmy Buffett was a, a dear friend of mine. And uh, we, I went on many fishing adventures with Jimmy and uh, it, the fishing with Jimmy was unlike any other fishing adventure. You would, if you've heard his songs and you listen to his philosophy of life, he had a s certain thing. And I remember one of, the, one of the last times we went in the Bahamas, and I, I, Tom will be able to laugh, Lori will be able to laugh at this. It, it, Jimmy lived a good life, and he believed in having nice things around. I mean, there were boats, there were things, and we would joke that is the is the Navy here because there often was more than one vessel, than we, more than we needed at the facility. So he wanted he had loved p fishing off a paddleboard, fly fishing off a paddleboard, um, which looks great and sounds poetic and all that. Paddleboards are. <laughs> You hook a fish on a paddleboard, it, it, there, you, there are complications. It's hard enough on dry land or in a drift boat to catch, a, to catch a good fish, right? Or on a skiff. So anyway, Jimmy was all ready. To, we, we traveled all the way over the west side of Andros, went through Middle Bike, and the rest of us were in skiffs, and we had our fly rods, we were saying goodbye, and Jimmy, the paddleboard came out. The paddleboard came, there were two paddleboards out. One was for Jimmy, and one was for the pilot of his seaplane, Gerald, who was a great guy. Gerald was going, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, Darren was going with Jimmy. So they were going off in one direction, and there was a third paddle board that the pilot was taking, and he had all his contraptions on it. And I said, what is, what is all that stuff, Gerald? And, and I said, where are you going? We're going back in the mangroves, uh, bonefish. And I said, what's all that? And he goes, oh, he, Gerald said, that's the drone, man. That's the drone. I said, wait a minute. He said, yeah, the, with the drone fall, and, and Jimmy had an earpiece on. He had the whole rig on. This is fly fishing. And so he could talk to Gerald at any time, and Gerald would say, there's a school of fish about 50 feet coming at you. And Jimmy would say, oh, okay. And, there, and he said, yeah, there's five fish. He had a drone up, and, so, and, and there's Gerald talking, and he's on his, you know, he's, and then Darren, and, and uh, here's what you learn. Um, Bonefish have been around a couple million years, and there's a reason they're, they're going to outlive all of us. Is, is it, Jimmy, you, you, if you're on a paddleboard, you don't necessarily see what's coming. And fish after fish somehow got by him, even with all the gear and everything. <laughs> so, he, do you all know what microdosing is? <laughs> well, bone fishing is hard enough without hallucinogens. <laughs> and, and I remember hearing just the crack of the radio, and I just remember Jimmy wasn't mad. I just heard him saying, do you all see the color of the clouds right now? <laughs> said, what are you? He saw what he needed to see. He was happy as he could be when he got back, didn't catch a fish. Uh, Gerald came back, the drone landed safely on the boat, and we went back to the lodge, and you know, relaxed for a while, but that was the, that was the deal. It was just a surreal experience, and uh, and it wasn't. Uh, it was enhanced in a way by, I guess, by the mushrooms or whatever it was. But in general, it, it, the nice thing is it didn't make a difference at that point because he probably would never have seen those fish if they had bumped in. So he would have seen something. It wouldn't have been the bonefish. Um, I'm, I, I'm going to tell another story, and then, we, then I'm going to, they asked me to take some questions, which I'm happy to do. But uh, this is the, I started with the story about up on the Sun River, my first trip to Montana. And I'm going to flash forward many years to the uh, Boulder River when I know what I'm doing, and I don't have an excuse for being stupid. And um, I was fishing at the, up, up the river with, uh, uh, I think, I'm sure Tom knows John Willis. And, and the, the ranch up there, and 
So they, I was going down to fish the upper boulder, and, and John, very, my, John said, here, you stay here and just fish just down this way. I didn't know my way around very well. And I'm gonna go up, I'm up river a little bit, and I'll meet you back here at a certain time. So I said, fine, I got waders on, and I had, I don't wanna say the brand, but it was the kind that you, you cinch here so that if you, if you do fall in, you don't, the waders don't necessarily fill up, and you don't necessarily expire. I thought that was a positive selling point. I had it cinched. I had them cinched tight as I could, and I was fishing away, and I don't know why I'd catch one every now and then. And here's what happened. I'm standing on one side of the bank. Again, it wasn't very far across. And there's this trout rising on my side of the bank, which I can't get to because of trees. So I think, well, I know what I'll do. I'll be a crafty person. I'll cross the, this little short part of the Boulder River, which how strong could it possibly be? And I'll get to the other side, and then I'll have an angle on these fish. So I got my flyer out, I'm all cinched. I start walking, and I think it's gravel beneath my feet. And I discover that it isn't, that it's soft. And when I put on my weight, and I, I sink down. And you know the things you cinch? I'm not, they don't work. <laughs> the water came pouring in. And, I, and again, I went downstream. This time I knew I ditched the rod right away. And I, the, they filled up, and this time it wasn't funny. There was no rock for me to land on like a gecko. There was nothing. I go into this pool, and I'm just, and I'm circling. Now it's full of water, and I, and I can't swim. Your legs, you can't, you know, you're weighted down. All I can do is do this, and it's not working. There's too much current, I think. And it really does start closing in. It really is darkness closing in because I was losing strength. And I thought, all I could go, what's going through my mind was I'm about to die over a 15-inch fish. <laughs> That's what they're going to say at the funeral. <laughs> I can't do that. I'm not going down for a little 15-inch rainbow. God bless them. I'm not dying for this. So... The adrenaline kicks in, and I'm just flashing like this, and I, and I feel like, I, I really do feel like it's going black. And there was one clot of the bank that had, fought, that had come down during the storm, of, like a mud bank. I went by, I was close enough with one hand, and I got my hand into that bank. And the current swung the, the bulk of the waders around. And, and so I was able to hold myself there, get the other hand in, and I, and I somehow put myself all the way up on the bed. Later, my finger, I thought my fingernails were all bleeding. But I didn't know that at the time. I was in complete shock. And this is absolutely true. I pull myself up. I can't breathe. I feel like I can't breathe, but I, and the water is cold. I can't even get the waders off. I'm so messed up. And I, I just kind of lay down in this field. And the rod's long gone, right? I'm laying there. I'm laying there thinking, oh, man, I really screwed up this time. But at least I, I won't drown. It'll just be a heart attack. And they won't have to. I won't get all bloated or anything and just come here and find me. It'll be, it'll be a lot neater. <laughs> so it seemed like hours passed, but I'm sure it was maybe 15 or 20 minutes. John Willis is calling my name. I can't even lift my head to respond. Carl, Carl, he turns the corner. He sees me, runs up, goes, holy shit. Let me call. He had a walkie-talkie. Let me call so-and-so. And, -so and, and he goes, God. He goes, I can't get any reception here. And I just, I'm just going like this. And he says, here, give me your hand. I, this is what he does. I swear to you. He takes my hand. He goes, I'm going to put some bear spray in your hand so you'll be safe if the bears come. <laughs> and I'm going to go get reception. <laughs> I swear. I'm lying there. I'm lying there thinking my last dire thoughts with a can of bear spray that I would surely have shot myself with, <laughs> barely be able to breathe. And I was in shock, it turned out. And all I'm thinking is, I got to do more of this fishing. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, I didn't die. But it... It did make me question everything. It does, yeah, any of you want to talk about anything? We can talk about the books. We can talk about uh, movies, TV. Uh, we can talk about religion. That's a good subject if you want to. <laughs> Politics is good. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to be in Montana because, we, you know, we were talking. We have to get away from all the political ads in Florida. <laughs> I've never seen more political ads on any... In, I heard they're spending more money 
both parties are throwing, throwing more money at Montana than in any other state. So per capita, God bless all of you. I don't know how you put up with it. Um, no questions? Seriously? You're just numb, aren't you? It's, I, I understand. Those were the good. I'll, I'll, t I'll get you in a minute. Yes. Uh, first of all, my dad's not here tonight. We want to tell you that you're staying up right here. We love everything you do. But uh, what do you think of Vince Vaughn and, and Joe? And, and how involved were you in? Oh, Bad Monkey. Yeah, the TV series. Um, Oh, the question was, what do I think of the TV show, A Bad Monkey, which just finished on uh, Apple TV, which was based on a, on a book I had written. And, and um, I go in with the, the most uh, modest expectations, any kind of Hollywood enterprise. I think, I think Tom will tell you that the ideal situation um, for a writer is for them to keep optioning your book every year and never make, never turn it, try to turn it into something. Because it's just perfect. You can say it's being developed and you're getting some sort of check and you don't have to live with the outcome of it. Um, and I was, I was, I'm always leery of it, but they did a good job. Vince Vaughn was great as the main character. And you know what the best part of it for me with the series was that uh, Bill Lawrence, who, who produced it and who did Ted Lasso, the casting was great, but also he insisted on shooting on location in Big Pine in Key West. And as much as I hate, I've spent my whole life trying to scare people away from Florida unsuccessfully, it did look beautiful. It looked so beautiful. It caught the vibe. I think it caught the key. I, I'm, I haven't seen the last episode. Please, if you have, don't tell me what happened. I have seen the scripts, but I don't remember. It's been a while since I read the book, but I think it's different. Um, but anyway, it's been, that's been a good experience. I mean, and they were, they did, I did, they did send me all the scripts and they, I talked to Bill fairly often, but they don't, they don't call you and ask, is it okay if we do this? Do you mind if we do this? It's more like they're gently breaking the news um, that something's going to happen and we hope you're okay with it. But the bottom line is it really doesn't matter because we own your soul now. So just <laughs> sit back. I remember when, years ago, I did a book called Strip Tease, and, and it was made into a movie with Demi Moore and Burt Reynolds, and, and, uh, and they filmed a lot of it in South Florida. And I, and, and, I re, and I remember they were so nice to me on the set, and everybody, I mean, uh, I met at least one of the actors that had actually read the book. You know, it was, it's very exciting for an author. Uh, they had actually read the book, you know, and, and uh, and they were, they were nice. I went to the set a couple days, and Demi Moore was as nice as she could be, and um, Burt Reynolds was as, as, as nice as he could be, and, and everybody was nice. And so the getting to the end of shooting, I remember the, the, the director calling me and saying, hey, I thought they were done, you know? And they had stuck pretty closely. They tried to, they told me, stick to this, the book. And authors always feel, uh, you, you, you're glad, you, part of you is glad when they're doing that until you see it on the screen, realize, Maybe that doesn't work as well on a screen as it did. I was brilliant on the page. Just, I'm not sure it translates as well. <laughs> so anyway, I get a call saying, I said, oh, when, when is it coming out? And they're going, oh, we, we've got to reshoot the ending. And these are the words that are dagger to every author's heart. Because if they're reshooting the ending, they're in trouble. And it isn't going to be anything like you would have written the ending to be. There's going to be some shooting. There'll be a car chase. There'll be, there might even be nudity that you didn't put in the book. They'll do anything at that point, and you, all you can do is hold, hold your breath. So they shot it, and I was, you know, I was, I was, I was a, I'm a team player. I said, okay, and they said, you want to go to the, the premiere at the Zigfield in New York? I said, yeah, man, that would be great. That would be great. I've never been to anything like that. And to me, it was going to be there. Bruce, she was married to Bruce Willis at the time, and he was going to be there. And, and uh, I said, sure, that'll be fun. I like New York, I'll go. And so there was a red carpet. Now, I didn't know anything about it. I, I just knew that there's a red carpet and there's all this paparazzi because uh, the, Demi Moore was in the movie. And, and um, oh, this is gonna lead me to another story. But anyway, so I, they said, okay, your turn to go up on the red carpet. But you have to stop here and you have to stop here for the paparazzi. I'm, not, I'm the writer. Anyway. <laughs> So I, I, the actors going in, they all stop, they do the pose, you know, this is before the internet, or anything, but they still, it was a big thing and they're all posing and, and I get to my ex and I stop and I look around and all the flash bulbs are going off, which is very flattering. And then, but then a voice comes out of the crowd of the cameramen and, and the paparazzi and the voice says, who are you? <laughs> That's true. 
and you know what? It's exactly what I needed to hear at that moment. And I said, I'm the writer. It's okay. And I kept on, I kept on walking. So I'll tell you one quick story. And then after that, they have, the, they have the after party at the Rainbow Room at the Rockefeller Center, also where I'd never been. I, knew, I read about it, big celebrity. And I didn't realize what they did in the old days in premieres. They invite a bunch of people to the after party that had nothing to do with the movie. They're like just professional celebrities, you know? So I get up, I come out of the elevator, and there's already, the, the celebs are already there. And there's two celebs that I recognize. And I'll tell you the one I was most nervous about meeting. There's Donald Trump, since young days, this would have been 96 or something, his young hotel. There's Donald Trump, fine, and there's Meatloaf. You know Meatloaf? <laughs> Bad out of hell. There's Meatloaf. And I'm scared shitless about meeting Meatloaf because here, you got to go through this line and you introduce yourself, and, they, and I didn't know how to address Meatloaf. <laughs> Think about it, do you, do you, meat? Do you say, hey, meat, I'm Carl. Mr. Mr. Loaf didn't sound good. That didn't sound good. I didn't, I didn't give a rat's ass about meeting Donald Trump, but I was nervous about Meatloaf. And I got, it, and I got up and I got up to Meatloaf and he saved me all the trouble. He just stuck out of his hand. He said, Meatloaf. And I said, Carl, nice to meet that, that was a true story. So. He didn't, by the way, he didn't know who the hell I was either. So that was perfect. Oh yes, you had your hand up. Same question. Oh, that's okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. The the question was, do I have trouble going from you know transitioning from writing the uh, more adult novels to the novels for young readers and. I thought I was going to, but then my editor, when I, they first came to me about, did you want to do a book for kids? And I thought they were nuts. And I said to her, have you not read any of the <laughs> adult books? Why would you want your kids to come anywhere near me? I said, I don't let my own kids till they were 13 or 14 go in the same room with the books, you know? And they said, no, listen, kids, and this is, I'll be serious for me. They said, kids love anything to do with nature and the outdoors and animals. And they also love smart ass humor and they also love it when you make fun of grown-ups and i said i spent my whole career in journalism making fun of grown-ups this will be easy and, and um and it is a, it is a different kind of novel the characters are younger so they don't come with the baggage and so obviously you don't have the adult situations that you have but the out my outlook the, i think the narrative voice is pretty it's it's funny but it's pissed off, which is how I live my life pretty much. It's pretty much authentic. Um, you know, it, you're, you're angry about things that are wrong in the world, and, and, but the kids are a great audience, and they, they get the humor. You don't ever have to explain a joke to them, and they, they, they get it right away. And what was rewarding was the connection, the letters you get from them, and they didn't even have to be in Florida, but if it was a book about little burrowing owls that are getting bulldozed, which was a page out of my own childhood, uh, so they could put up a development uh, called Hawaiian Gardens in Broward County, Florida, bury the owls. And the celebrity spokesman, and I'll be the only one here probably old enough to remember, and I don't barely remember, my mother barely did, Eve Arden. You remember this actress? She was a celebrity spokesman for Hawaiian Gardens, the place that they paved over all these little owls. So am I bitter still? Yes. Does it... Eat at me night and day? No, only part of the time. But, but it's, been, it's been cool. The, 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 they're great, kids are a great audience. And I, I just have to, the one thing you can't do, obviously, if you, you can't, you know, the, the characters, you can't have the backstory that you have for the in adult books. You can't have a, a guy with, you know, uh, you know, four marriages and a, some sort of social disease as one of your characters. <laughs> It just, you, why clutter up a kid's book with that? I think they'd probably be fine with it, I, you know. Yeah, one more, I'm sorry, yeah, yes sir. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, Disney is not a fan of mine uh, because I wrote a book called Team Rodent, How Disney Conquers, How Disney Devours the World. And it came out at the same time as Michael Eisner's biography. <laughs> and it outsold Michael's bio, Eisner's biography. So he, but yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it's a hard thing to watch. And, and to some extent, if you're from Bozeman or from places in Montana that have changed so dramatically, uh, Bozeman, even a town like Livingston or Missoula or any of them, when you see when people fall in love with a place, uh, what can happen to it if you just sort of fling the doors wild op open and come on in and you see the loss of habitat and you see the pollution, which uh, was devastating in the Keys when I was living there, and you see all of that, and, and so you carry it with you. But I think, I don't know whether Tom would agree with me or not, but I think that... Uh, when you're writing satire, I mean, you want to be funny, and you want to be funny on every page, but I think a lot of good satire comes from a, a place of anger and a, a sense of injustice about things. I mean, in my case, I want, I want readers to laugh, and I want them to have a good time, but I want them to laugh for the right reasons, you know? I want them to get the joke, what the joke really is, and, what's, and at the root of it is something that obviously uh, is upsetting and, and it's also irreparable. You mentioned what's happening now in Florida. Here we are. We have a governor who has banned the, the term climate change from all state. No one in any state agency can use the word climate change. And I don't know how many counties we have that are underwater today or that were underwater two weeks ago. Uh, that, n that didn't happen when I was a kid. The, the, the Gulf of Mexico has risen. Water in the key, it's demonstrative. You can look at the thing and see it. He won't let that be. And uh, he had these great plans that he tried to ram through. There's a beautiful state park near Jupiter, Florida, if you ever been there, Jonathan Dickens State Park, which I went to as a kid. And he decided that there was just a lot of open pine scrub land that wasn't being used. So he hatched a plan to put in two championship golf courses. And he got Tiger Woods and Jack Nicklaus that were going to do these golf courses. And it, they were going to be developed by a charity, a nonprofit that uh, supports veterans groups. Now, as you know, a lot of golf courses give all their money to charity, right? If you go to Augusta, I'm sure this is, was the plan, and it was leaked, and it was stopped. But that's the mentality, is that uh, open land is an eyesore. And what's the point of having just some habitat for some bobcats and scrub jays? and? and whatever else happens to live there. And it's, it takes you out of the city immediately. You're there because it's a pretty urbanized area in, in Palm Beach County. But this is what you, you have to think in the year 2024 that you're, you know, some of us are old enough to remember uh, uh, James Watt, who was Ronald Reagan's Secretary of Interior, who, you know, I don't think he ever looked at a tree that he didn't think, you know, uh, you know, would, would make, would, would be better off as firewood or a, a dining room table. They, they had no soul for the, for the outdoors. And here you're doing it. Now it's a little more dangerous because they're masquerading as, as environmentalists. DeSantis, as Ron DeSantis has got a bunch of, uh, Red Tide Ronnie is what I call him, but he, he, he got a bunch of money for the Everglades restoration and, and he's now an environmentalist, but all this stuff's going on on the side. So yeah, no, it's all going on. The fight never stops. You all are at the, you are on the, the front of the battle here, I think, in Montana about deciding which way you want to go. No one in Florida seems to, to learn, have learned any lessons from what happened in South Florida. I mean, uh, it's all filled up, so now they're just, in my lifetime, this population is more than quintupled of the state. It was, I think, it was less than five million when I was born. It's now almost 23 million people. I don't want you to think about Montana too hard in those terms, but it can happen before your very eyes if you're not careful. So I'm going to leave you with that. And thank you for being so great and, and so understanding. One more. There's a, there's a miscreant. Hold on. Do I miss the column? Almost every day. <laughs> well, 
Well, I, I, yes, I do miss the column, but I'll tell you when I missed it most, right after I retired from the column, within about two months, Matt Gates came along. Oh. God, it broke my heart. <laughs> Thank you all. Oh. So I know I'm not the person you came to hear, but I would be thrilled if you'd stay for just a few more minutes. But first of all, I'm Dorlin Rossman. I'm the dean of the MSU library, and we are the ones who invited Carl here to um, talk to you. So first of all, Thank you. here is a gift bag from Oh, Andrew. perfect. Sorry. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. So that's uh, some gifts from the MSU library. Um, and so one of the things I, I've been all over the place thinking about what I might say, I have my notes, but one of the things that I think um, Carl has really brought out for me is just thinking about like why do I like fly fishing and frankly I like just being around water. So my first time in being in Fort Myers was I, I grew up in North Carolina. I've been in Montana for 23 years which is more than I've lived anywhere else um, but I was at University of North Carolina and you had to take PE classes. So I took two PE classes. One was water safety instruction so I would save people from drowning. Uh, I had to teach football players how to swim in order to graduate from UNC. And then I took a scuba diving class and we spent the entire semester in a classroom learning about scuba diving, going in a pool, looking at each other, putting on weight belts, and just looking at humans. It was so boring. And so at the end of the class, my instructor actually um, chartered a trip for those of us who chose to, to go down to Key West and do five scuba diving dives. And so I actually got to see real fish instead of humans underwater, and it was amazing. And so the reason I like to fly fish is just being around the water. I mean, any excuse to be around water, and you know, if I catch something, if I see the fish, that's great. If I don't actually get the fish, it's disappointing, but I got to be around water, and I, I, that's one of the things I find really enjoyable about Carl's writing is just those moments of being around water. And I think that's part of what he's trying to encourage us all to preserve. Um, so um, I wanted to remind you about this Trout and Salmon and Lecture Series. This was started in 2011, so we've had this annually, except for a couple of years during the pandemic, and Dr. Richard Hoffman started that with Trout and Fly Work and Play in Medieval Europe. So over the time and every year, we've had speakers including writers, government officials, angling enthusiasts, professors, scientists, many of whom are here tonight, who have actually spoken at this lecture series. So why would the library at MSU have a trout series? And the reason we do is because we have a collection at the library of trout and salmonid materials. And it's the largest collection in the world around materials for a library around trout and salmonid. That's a really big deal. And it's not just about the fish, but it's about the ecosystems, about water access, about all the stories we tell, and preserving that for future generations. And so, that's really a big deal, and the reason we have that is because a lot of you have helped support it. So we have collections like Bud Lilly's collection. Um, we have a Trout and Salmonid initiative that was started by Bruce Morton, who was the library dean who hired me back in 2001. And so he started this collection, and at that point we didn't have any materials, and we've increased that and increased that, and right now we have over 22,000 volumes of materials, many of those that are digitized. Um, Jim Thule, my colleague, who we've worked together a long time, he started the Angling Oral History Collection. Just today, he interviewed Carl. And that will be added to our online collection of oral histories. So we're telling the stories of being fly fishermen. We're preserving those histories. We are... Um, trying to make it so that future generations have access to this. Um, the MSU Fish and Wildlife Ecology Management Program is one of the reasons that we do this at Montana State. This ties directly back to the curriculum. Students can come in and use the materials and see how fly fishing, ecologies, um, fisheries, how that influences so many aspects of our lives. And it is integral to being in this part of the United States and actually North America. Don't want to finish, uh, forget our colleagues to the North and South. Um, so one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is because I want to encourage you to continue to support this. So Bruce Morton, like I mentioned, he started this collection back in the early 2000s and he started it with an endowment. So he was trying to endow 
us to have enough money to continue this work. And so I've picked up that from when he started, because when he started, he started basically with nothing. And so should you feel inclined, please help me round out an endowment he started 20 years ago. And so when you're leaving, there's a gift form. This isn't, I'm not passing a basket, but I just want to encourage you to think about, is this something that you'd like to continue to see? We want to continue to bring in lecturers, have opportunities for people to come use our collections. It's a collection in the library on the second floor, open to the public, and much of it is digitized and online. So if you feel like this is something that resonates for you, um, please consider your support. And that could be donating collections, it could be donating time, donating resources, but ultimately this is a public good. And that's one of the reasons we're excited to have Tom, I mean, sorry, uh, Carl and others here. So I wanna thank a few people. Um, thank you, Carl, for being here. And my husband and I were reading your book at the same time. We were talking the other day about it being a thriller. And my concept of a thriller is when you wanna tell the other person what happened before they read that part. So as I said to my husband, oh, there's this part on the boat. And he said, oh, did they find the other snake yet? I was like, ah, why are you telling me that? No, I have not read that part yet. It's because he was so excited he wanted to tell me about it. So it was definitely a thriller. Um, so thank you, Carl, for being here. Um, thank you, Tom, for uh, introducing uh, Carl today and for your donation of your papers to our collection. That's just something that keeps on giving. Um, thank you to Jim for bringing Carl here, bringing so many of our folks here and being such an amazing resource. I want to thank Ann Vincenguera, Gavin Herzog, Christina Trinnell, and Michaela Bader for their support in um, preparing this event, our Friends of the Library board members. Um, so I mentioned Bud Lilly, and our current chair of the Friends of the Library board is Chris Lilly, and he is, amongst other things, Bud's son, and so he's helping carry on his legacy. And so thank you for the other board members who are here. If you're a board member, we're going to raise your hand real quickly. So several of you, yeah, we've got several in the audience. So thanks to you all for supporting it. And most of all, I want to thank you all for being here. So you can come have a tour of our archives, come use the archives, use our online resources, and you can come back next year for our next Trout Lecture. So thank you so much for being here tonight. And there's food over here. Please enjoy that beverage over there. And uh, thank you. and. Have a great evening.